structure is very important for you as a nonfiction editor. Does it need to be divided into chapters? Does it need to be divided into subheadings? Particularly when you're dealing with book length nonfiction, um, you know, this could be anything from a self-help book uh, to a white paper. Um, you want to make sure those subheadings are there because a lot of times the authors don't think to do that. Um, so that will be part of your job, making sure that it reads smoothly, making sure that the chapters and sections are in the right order and making sure um, that you might not be doing the proper fact checking like a reporter would do but you want to make sure that everything is cited. So if you're dealing with academic work and they're just making factual assertions, but there's no citation, as the editor, it will be your job to point things like that out. And so these are the kinds of things you need to be familiar with before you start offering this for money. For fiction, probably with this group, you're a lot more familiar about what kinds of editing you will be offering as someone who edits fiction, um, starting off with the developmental or big picture edits. You know, this is where you look at the how the story hangs together, how those plot and character arcs work. Um, you need to be able to verbalize what works and what doesn't. And ideally, you would be able to provide advice to the author of how to fix the problems that you've noted. Um, particularly with developmental edit, that's kind of what they're looking for. They don't just want you to point out the issues. They want you to kind of give them at least a little bit of guidance on how to fix them, especially with new authors. They might not even be sure how to. Um, it's important that you at least be passingly familiar with the genre you're editing. So for instance, um, I don't edit children's uh, literature at all. The youngest that I will go is middle grade. Um, you know, if we're talking about children's picture books or even young children's storybooks, I don't know what makes them good. I, I don't have children myself and I don't remember being a child enough to kind of put myself in there. So, and I don't know what agents are looking for as well. Um, so I don't edit that because I can't be helpful to the author. However, if we're talking sci-fi and fantasy, give it, give it all. I want it all and I will do an excellent job because I know it's being published now. I know what people are reading now and I know what the conventions and what the plot beats need to be, uh, especially with romance. Romance readers are, um, they're kind of persnickety on where those beats need to land. They're, they're they're kind of a militant group. So if you don't read romance, for instance, before you start editing romance, you probably want to pick up some bestsellers from the last two years or so. Uh, maybe log on to Book Talk and make sure that you're familiar with what you need to be looking for as you edit that romance on the developmental edit. Uh, once we get into line edits, this isn't as important because you're not looking at the big picture. What you're looking at is the readability, basically. You're polishing those sentences. You're rephrasing where needed. And of course, you're at a, you know, you're also checking punctuation um, and grammar, not so much to the point of proofreading, but it is a part of the line editing. So if you're not super familiar with the genre, that's not as big of a problem with line editing because you're just on a sentence level making it uh, correct and beautiful. Proofreading is our last look that in some ways is kind of the hardest. It generally tends to cost less uh, than the rest, but it can be harder because it's the expectation that it will be as close to perfect as humanly possible when you're done. Uh, so that does exist. And then there's also critiques. So beta reading is often a paid service. Um, it hasn't traditionally been, but unless you already have an existing community, Finding beta readers just, you know, in your social group who are willing to put in that work and give you a good beta read and are familiar with your genre, it's it's not always easy for everybody. So beta reading is also a paid service that you could offer. Um, ARC readers generally for the ARC read in and of itself are often generally not paid because um, that could be a conflict of interest because an ARC reader is expected to publish a review of the book. Um, on the retailer. However, this can be done in conjunction with a social media platform. You can basically build an influencer career off of being an ARC reader. Um, if you're on Book Talk, if you're on Bookstagram, a lot of times you see that, you know, these, uh, these big bestsellers um, are being pushed by these book bloggers. You know, they're, they get the big promotion packages. That's, that's their job. They are a social media influencer and they do get paid as a social media influencer, but not for the ARC read itself if that makes sense. All that being said, you might be wondering, well, how much can I make from this? What is the thing that I should charge? And there are standards. Um, I have the URL there at the bottom. The best way to kind of gauge what you should be charging for a specific type of edit is from the Editorial Freelance Association. They come out with a new rate chart 
every year. They are wonderful. They are very helpful. And that's good to look at and kind of gauge if that's what you want to charge. I will say upfront, uh, particularly for developmental edit, I charge a little bit lower than the EFA recommends. The reason that I do this uh, is primarily because I work with independently published authors. These are authors who are most likely going to have to wait for two or three books before they start making a profit or n never mind a livable wage um, from their books. And so a lot of them are still working a day job. And if I were to charge the EFA's developmental edit rate, which I think is three cents a word, um, it might be up to four cents a word, actually. In a lot of cases, that might make me out of reach for a lot of my target audience. So as an editor, it is incumbent upon you to look at your target audience, to look at what the market will bear. So if you're working with a lot of new authors, like brand spanking new authors, um, this is their first novel, you might want to adjust that. Additionally, when you're first getting started, you're probably going to have lower rates, even though you know for a fact you're going to raise them later. This is par for the course. Um, you know, if, if you're building up your reputation, if you're building up your reviews, you usually need to charge a little bit lower to entice people to basically take a chance on you. Um, and then once you start getting some reviews, you start getting client base, then you can raise it up to the market rate. Um, that's definitely what I had to do. When you're assessing what to charge, it's important not to undercut yourself and the effort that you have to go through. Assess the time investment. How long is this going to take? If we're talking about, you know, the service that I provide, which is a combination of a developmental and a line edit, that's a significant time investment. You know, we're not doing any skimming. We're not going to just be able to listen to the, you know, computer generated narration. No, it's it takes several days. It can take up to a month. Um, so you, you need to be respectful of your own time and charge accordingly. Assess the difficulty. So if you're working on a nonfiction book, for instance, that's going to require a lot of research on your part. Um, yes, it's it's already written for you, but you need to check the citations. You need to make sure that everything is in accordance with a particular style guide that they've provided you that's different from the normal style guides, things like that. Um, or, you know, no one likes to talk about this, but if you know that this client is on the persnickety side and you know they're going to be calling you and emailing you all the time, there is something as uh, called a PETA tax, P-I-T-A, pain in the ass. <laughs> um, so if somebody is more work than most of your other clients, you know, it's it's acceptable to, to charge them a little bit more because they're taking more of your time. Um, you always want to assess business norms, and that's where the EFA comes in. They're very helpful. Um, I recommend clearly posting your prices. You don't have to. Some people prefer like, hey, if you, if you want to get a quote for your job, you know, you can book a call with me here. A lot of industries do choose to do that uh, because they want to have that face to face with a prospective client, not only, you know, to, to get the client more invested, but also to gauge if, if you want to work with this client. I choose not to do that. Um, I found that the rate of people willing to book calls with me drop significantly if I didn't clearly post my prices, because I think people were afraid that they couldn't even guess what I charged. And they were afraid of being caught on camera, being shocked at a at a price they couldn't afford. So it's, I recommend posting your prices or posting a range. So for my ghostwriting, for instance, it's a range. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to charge you until I see what you've got already prepared and how much work it's going to be from me. So if you say, okay, you know, for a developmental edit, I charge between two and five cents a word. That usually just gives your, your prospect an idea of whether they can afford to work with you. Um, and I've got on here that it is a fact that, that the lower you price, the more tire kickers you get. You know, they're not really serious about being an author. This is something that they're just kind of doing. They can afford it. Why not? Um, and I don't know why that is, but a lot of times when you are on the lower end of the price spectrum, you do tend to get clients who can sometimes be more difficult. Higher prices, it's a double-edged sword. They tend to be less troublesome sometimes, but there's fewer of them. So ask yourself, okay, can I charge a lot more for my services, but having fewer clients? And that's something that as a freelancer, um, you need to kind of make that decision for yourself and what you're looking for in your career. Like I said, the good news about getting started with a services-based business, specifically editing, is that it is so easy to get started. 
since you're all joining me here on Zoom, I can assume you already have a computer. Um, the good news about computer technology these days is you don't have to get the top of the line um, iPad Pro or anything like that. Most you know, regular computers that you can get for several hundred dollars at your computer store will give you everything that you need. Um, you will also need software. Um, if you're going to be an editor, there's going to be a wide range of what people prefer. Some people are Mac people, some people are PC people, but regardless of which one you are, you will need Microsoft Word um, and you will need a passing understanding of Google Docs. For me, I always edit in Word because the track changes for me is superior. Um, I have never worked in Pages, which is the um, Mac only um, word processor. And so I don't even know if they have a track changes function. But if you are going to be doing a developmental or line edit, I strongly suspect, I strongly recommend using Microsoft Word. It is superior. Uh, Google Docs, it gets it done. It's quick and dirty. Um, but as for myself, if I'm working in Google Docs, I'll make a copy of the client's document and put it onto my drive because I don't like them being in there while I'm in there. So, um, you know, depending on the arrangement you have with your client, that's something to think about. Um, you do need a website. And by need, I mean, you really do. Most of us get our start on freelance websites like Fiverr or Upwork, and that is totally fine. But you also need your own base of operations. The good news is, is that you can get the website itself for free on several sites. There's one called Card, C-A-R-R-D. If you use MailerLite with your, um, with your author newsletter, they offer the ability to create landing pages. And this is part of your existing subscription, either free or paid. Um, Canva allows you to create websites and the, it is free. Now, the domain that you create, which will be the name of your editing business, that's going to cost you a little bit a year, but it's usually very cheap. It's usually like something like $20 a year. Um, so this is the cost of doing business and it's worth it because at some point, you know, maybe you never want to leave the freelance sites, but you also want to be able to have your own business where you can get direct your own clients versus having the freelance sites take all those fees. But with that in mind, you do need a payment processor. Um, I personally use Square. I'm very fond of it. Um, other well-known ones are Stripe and Wise, particularly if you're not in the U.S., or PayPal. Um, Venmo and Cash App do exist. However, since you're doing this as a business, I recommend to people not to use Venmo or Cash App because those are more personal. Um, they don't really say professional um, to prospective clients. And definitely do not ask your clients to use Zelle or any kind of a direct bank account um, transfer because that's kind of scammy. The reason that a lot of scammers use those is because there's no way for them to do a chargeback. So, you know, if they get scammed and they're like, oh, I'm going to buy an editing service. OK, well, just just sell me the money. There's no way that the prospect who got scammed can do a chargeback to get their money back, you know, when they didn't get their edit. Um, so I, I generally say, you know, use use um, something more respectable like Square or PayPal. Now, the big thing everybody wants to know where to get clients. And this also depends on kind of how you want to do things. I will say right off the bat, um, things like pay-per-click ads, these are generally not a good use of money. Um, and I am including Google ads in this. Um, it's It's generally not. Um, you're still going to get drowned out and it would take an enormous amount of clients to make that money up for you. And if you're working as a solopreneur, you can't handle 30 clients at one time. So if you were running an e-com business, ads are the way to go. But if you're running a one person services business, they're really not, which is why we have, you know, this collection here. The first is, you know, just getting a job working for an agency like first editing, um, that way, you're not really acquiring clients yourself. You're being given clients and you're being paid. Now, when you work for someone else, you are getting a lower rate of pay because the company that employs you that is advertising, that is making sure they're on the first page of Google, you know, they have overhead. So which means that the fee that you take for your editing jobs is going to be lower. So when you're first starting out, this might be a good option for you. It might not as you get a little bit more experienced. As you get more experienced, the next two are where you want to concentrate your efforts, which is the freelance sites like Fiverr, Upwork, and Guru, um, and social media. 
Social media, depending on the site, is a slower burn. It takes longer. You actually have to connect with people. You actually have to comment on other people's posts. You have to have engaging posts of your own. And you want to choose the platform that is best suited to you and how you communicate. For me, it's X, which used to be Twitter. Everyone hates the new name, but (laughs) here we are. Um, For some people, it might be Instagram. I've also had amazing luck on YouTube. YouTube, I, I don't even know if you want to call it social media, but creating videos on YouTube. For me, I do long form. They're usually between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, Sometimes they're about the author communities. Sometimes they're about author tools like software. Um, And a lot of times they're just about, you know, my experience as an editor. It's like, you know, just your your educational stuff. Okay, here's here's how not to get scammed if you hire a ghostwriter, uh, things like that. So you don't necessarily have to start an editing YouTube or an editing TikTok, but you want to make sure that whatever content you're creating, you are targeting authors and writers of the content that you want to edit. So if you're only doing dissertations, for instance, the content that you create will be to target college students and grad students. Um, So, you know, depending on if you want to be on camera depending on if you want to do video, short form or long form, depending on whether you, you're more of a text person. Um, decide which platform works best for you and which you get the most response on. Like, I love Instagram, but Instagram hates me. <laughs> it's like, oh, you want to post reel after reel and post after post and all those slideshows? Tough. Three people are going to see it. How about that? So I don't spend a lot of time on Instagram. It's so dispiriting. <laughs> but I do get uh, good impressions. I do get good click through and I get clients off of both YouTube and X. So definitely experiment with social media where you get the most feedback, where people seem most interested in what you're offering. The final uh, way to do this, and I don't do this myself, and most of us are terrified to do this, but uh, networking and cold outreach. And again, this depends on what kind of editing you're doing. This would probably be more popular if you were in the nonfiction genres. A lot of times fiction authors get bombarded with scams like, hey, I can promote your book and make you a number one. And so they're very wary about cold DMs. Whereas nonfiction authors or people who are not career-wise authors, but have said, oh, well, I'm a motivational coach and I'm writing a book. You know, if you want to slide into their DMs being like, hey, you know, I'd be happy to to edit this for you, you know, things like that. They're a little bit more receptive over on the nonfiction side. Um, And then if you're doing something very targeted, like if you are editing nothing but corporate policy manuals and you are sending out emails to small business owners, you know, who have between 10 and 20 employees, you know, just big enough where they they need to have that HR paperwork, but they don't have an HR, like something like that. That would be really great to do cold outreach with. Um, so that is an option that exists. It's not one that I, I've taken advantage of, um, but it, it is out there. So don't feel like you're, you're just confined. Um, by the freelance sites or social media. Bad clients are a fact of life. Um, The good news is, regardless of how you communicate with them, even if you jump straight into a video call or whether you're chatting back and forth or having emails, a lot of times the bad clients will announce themselves immediately. Um, I don't know why I put the red flags second, but... um, These are very common red flags when you're dealing with someone who, even if they do pay you on time, and even if, you know, they do everything they say they do, a lot of times they're just, they're miserable to work with and you don't want to work with them again. Um, Having a defensive attitude, um, a big one these days that I've found is, yeah, hi, my last editor scammed me and I want your assurance that you won't use any AI on my work and I'm going to be running it through an AI detector. And I reserve the right to get a refund if my AI detector says that you, you know, things like that. It's, it's like, okay, bro, you are coming in hot and I don't want to work with you. Like it, <laughs> you don't want to work with somebody. And that's like your first exchange with this person. Um, no, thanks. Um, the next one, and this is not a malicious thing, but being unclear or undecided on what they even want, you know, they, they've written a book or they've written a nonfiction thing. Okay. Well, who's your target audience? They don't know okay, well, what do you want to do with this book? You know, do you want to launch your author career or are you trying to promote your business? Oh, I don't know. You know, if they have no idea, they just wrote a book on a whim and they're kind of looking for you to tell them what to do. 
it's not going to be a miserable experience, but it can lead to them being unhappy, not because you've done anything wrong, but because they didn't know what they wanted in the first place. So that's not necessarily a deal breaker. Just be kind of wary of it. People who state up front they can't afford your service, especially if your prices are clearly posted. Um, I run into this more on Fiverr. I post my services on Fiverr in addition to my own website. Um, the, the prices are clearly posted and you can use a calculator to say, oh, my, my novel is 60,000 words. What will this level of editing cost me? But if they slide into my DMs, be like, hi, um, I can't afford that. You know, do you have a deal for me? Never work with that person. Ever. That is the person who is going to do a chargeback. Never. They don't want to pay for editing. They want to take your labor and they don't want to pay for it. Um, so just don't. Um, especially like if you don't post your prices, okay, fair enough. They don't know how much you charge. <laughs> but if they know how much you charge and then they still state up front that they don't want to pay it, then they need to get some with someone with a lower rate. Um, any kind of bragging about firing or failing to pay previous writers. Oh, well, they didn't live up to my standards. Can you live up to my standards? This is some weird kind of negging thing. And I've found it largely with nonfiction authors. A lot of times where they're not, you know, author isn't their primary job. Um, they're like a business owner. And I don't know if they're like trying to make me compete for their business or whatever, but I found them to be unpleasant uh, to do business with. So I don't. Um, and the last one is weird vibes. Trust your gut. So if someone isn't saying anything wrong, but like, you know, there's a big long lag between their messages when it says that they're online or, you know, if you if you just get a weird feeling, it's a valid thing not to just to just walk away. Be like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm I'm busy for the next six months. You know, we can work together at that point or something like that. Um, definitely trust your gut if somebody is behaving very unusually. And as you get into it, you know, you'll you'll have a good feel for what people usually want to talk about when they first reach out and and who's going to be fun to work with. Um, regardless of who you work with, whether you adore them or whether it's just like, oh, they're all right, you always want to do a contract or have a posted terms of service. Um, you know, you might think it's overkill, you know, if you're just editing a short story, oh, we don't need a full contract. And that's that's fine, that's valid. Um, on my website, you know, if you post an or if you place an order through me, I have a clearly posted terms of service. So if you want revisions, that's awesome. You get two and you have to request them within 10 days of receiving your most recent draft, um, you know, things like that. And I attach it to every invoice. If you're dealing with uh, um, a site like Upwork or Fiverr, they have their own terms of service. So you are protected. And the systems that they have in place are actually very good about kind of helping freelancers not be taken advantage of, not, you know, giving their labor away for free and not having clients, you know, take advantage. I mean, it does still happen, but the systems are in place to protect you from that. Um, I don't work with Upwork, but I've, I've heard, you know, pretty good things, you know, every once in a while a scammer will get through. Um, but for the most part, you know, their terms of service do protect you and make sure that you get paid for your labor. But if you're out on your own, you need to make sure that you either have a contract or terms of service or both. Uh, for me, with ghostwriting clients, we get a contract every time. Uh, for editing, if it's a longer job um, or if there's any kind of unique aspects to it, I will send them a contract just so it's in writing. Okay, here's what you've paid for. Here's when you're going to get it back. And this gives them comfort as well. Because I've heard some stories on TikTok where somebody sends their editor you know, their novel. And three months later, they still don't have it back. It's like, you know, that's something that scares authors as well. So a contract is also something that protects the authors that you work with. You know, it, it helps them feel comfortable. It's like, look, this is a business arrangement that we have. You are giving me this money up front. Um, some editors choose to take half up front and half at the conclusion. Um, I have been stiffed exactly once and that was enough. So I actually bill in full up front. Um, you might make a different choice, particularly when you're first getting started. Um, that's up to you as well. But, but um, one thing I do want to focus on before we move on is um, time limits on revision requests and number of revision requests. That's very important. In my contracts, I have something that's called a termination clause where the client can terminate our relationship at any time. And they they have to pay for work that has been done. But like if they if they cut it off and I've only edited halfway through, they get refunded for the half that I haven't edited yet. Fine. Fair enough. 
But I, as the editor, also have the ability to terminate. And again, the client will be refunded for any work not done. But they will not be refunded for work that is done. And this is because sometimes clients want to keep coming back. Okay, I know it's been six months, but um, this person on Instagram, they bought my book and they found this, this, and this, and, you know, subjective changes. Um, can we, can we do a, another revision? No, no, we can't because it's been six months. And as you'll see in my terms of service, you have 10 days. Okay. You accepted and that's it. So you, you want to do that. You don't like to think that people will be unreasonable, but there are some people out there who think that just because they give you money, even if it's not a lot of money, that basically they own you. Um, so the terms of service and the contracts will always protect you. They will not protect you from chargebacks. I have a whole section in the book about chargebacks, but you will at least have, um, if a chargeback occurs, the contract and the terms of service will be what you submit to your payment processor saying, no, look, this is what we agreed to. And I delivered every last bit of it. This person is in violation of the contract they signed, if that makes sense. And that is the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of getting your editing business up and running. And I would love to take anybody's questions. Thank you so much, Kristen. That has been absolutely marvelous. So let's just have a look. Have we got any questions coming in at all? Um, just have a peek at this moment in time. We don't. So my question is, when um, did you um, first get your job at first editing way back 15 years ago? So what made you make that choice? That was 2011, if you can believe it. It was so long ago. Um, I was working as an editor uh, for the federal government, and I was still pretty early in my career, so I wasn't making a whole lot. And I was newly married, and <laughs> my husband brought a lot of debt. He's he's an engineer, so he had to go to a lot of school. And so it's like, well, you know, uh, the good thing about a federal job is it cuts off right at 4 p.m. I had plenty of time. You know, there was no overtime. So it's like, you know, let me let me look and see if there's any virtual jobs. You know, these virtual jobs are kind of new. Let me see if I can find one. And first editing, I found them on Indeed. And uh, they asked me to apply and send in some samples, which I had plenty because it was part of my day job. Um, and luckily for me, they hired me and it was, I worked there for 10 years. Um, and, you know, I started slowly kind of acquiring my own clients through these methods that I mentioned. But yeah, I, I worked there for almost 10 years. It was it was great. It was a good place to get started. I got a lot of experience. That's absolutely fabulous. Linda O'Donnell said, when you're editing fiction, do you examine issues of plausibility in the story? Oh, most definitely. Um, well, it depends. So a lot of times when we're dealing with things like fantasy, sci-fi there are leaps of logic there are things that make sense in the world but aren't necessarily you know real science um i don't get into that like i if it's like the hard sci-fi especially like people are like no physics doesn't work like that i'm not into physics so i don't do that um but if something doesn't work within the world with the rules as they've established them then yes i will point that out it's like wait a minute well why didn't they do this because in chapter two they did this and so it makes sense you know so i always keep that confined to the world as they have created it a fabulous answer right cindy and um, villain uh, has asked are there specific tags that you use on social media to help find writers I don't. And let me tell you why. Um, on X, especially, if you use any hashtags, like that is the most uncool noob thing. I don't know why. I don't know when that happened, because it used to be you had to load your post with hashtags. Um, so on on Twitter, you don't use them at all. Um, but what does work, weirdly enough, and I think this is th true for threads as well. If you post, I am looking for you know, authors of, you know, speculative fiction. I'm looking for authors of children's fiction, you know, come and hang out in my weird little world. Don't say I'm offering a service, but just say, hey, this is who I want to get to know. And the social media algorithms will read those words and they will actually show your post to people 
who they think will like that post because they do it based on keywords. And Instagram is that way too. They they've moved away from using the hashtags as much. They actually look at the actual content of your post. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on Instagram because as you've heard, I'm terrible at it. No one likes me there, but um, I, I have seen that they're, they're not as a big a fan of, of hashtags anymore. TikTok, I, I think still uses them. I can't believe anyone doesn't absolutely adore you. Right. So thanks very much for that with the hashtags. That's a shame because in the, whenever writing my A, I always like to add a bit of a hashtag, but that's good to know. Yeah, right. Um, so um, Anita Jackson's asked, are there any certification or courses you would recommend? Not that I can personally recommend. I will say... I mean, other than Fictionary, of course, um, that developmental editing program is is fabulous. And with the software assisting you, it, it really is great, um, especially when you're dealing with a convoluted um, fantasy with multiple timelines. I, it's it's indispensable. Um, is it UC Berkeley? But there's a, a University of California and they do have an online um collegiate program and you can specialize in editing and you can specialize um in ghost writing not ghost writing just writing um and you can use those towards college credit if you want or you can just take a one-off class um i do recommend taking a grammar uh course and a punctuation course like just a mechanics and the reason that i do that is because most of us who are naturally we love to read and so we learn by reading and we learn by just kind of absorbing it rather than looking at the mechanics. The problem with that, if you've noticed, a lot of people don't know how to use a semicolon. The reason they don't is because they they learn by reading. And if they see it used incorrectly, you know, they, they haven't studied why it's right. So if you're going to be an editor, um, it's very important to take like a, a grammar and punctuation course or you can explain like a lot of times you're your editing client will be like, oh, well, Microsoft Word said that this was wrong. It's not wrong, but Word is, Word's grammar checker is terrible, as we all know. Um, you need to be able to explain why, no, actually, Microsoft Word is wrong. Fabulous. All right, Nikki Davenport said, what should we have prepared to submit for an application for fiction editing, a short story of our own we've edited? That could work. I don't think most places are picky about what um, you edit. So if it's somebody else's short story, if it's a snippet of a novel, um, as long as you can submit it with the track changes showing where you've got the comments in in the um, in the side, you know, just to show what you have to say about big picture items and the kind of sentence level changes that you would make as well. Fantastic. So Angie's asked, do you ever get a client, especially for line editing or copy editing, where you get started and realize their manuscript hardly needs any work? And if so, what do you do? Yes, and that that is so challenging. I have a particular novelist, uh, B.R. Keed. He just came out with his third uh, in a series. And I feel overtly guilty for taking money from this man because his work is so clean because he goes through a series of beta readers before he sends it to me. And I actually told him, I was like, look, you know, because he, he got line edits for the first two. I'm like, this is so clean you know i don't even know if you need to send this to me and he insisted he was like no because you catch things that nobody else does and i understand it's mostly clean fine fair enough and on the third one he actually got a developmental edit and he found that to be better because again he didn't really need it for the line editing portion what he, what he wanted was critique and analysis for the big picture stuff so even though it was more money that was more valuable to him so it's like if you if you feel like look your sentences are beautiful it's big picture stuff that you need help with or, or things like that. Or, oh, you know, you really don't need a line edit. Maybe you just need a proofread. Um, you you should say that because, you know, being transparent with your with your clients is, is always good and important. Absolutely. Honesty always is the most important thing there. Right. So um, we've got from Katie McWilliams. Do you anticipate a certification processing um, going international for editors with low barriers to entry, a computer and a website? Would the industry need this to sustain quality? I would like to see that. I would like a certification process. Um, obviously, there there is some art involved in being an editor. Um, so it's not just strictly grammar and things like that. But I would like an international certification specifically because the writers community is international. And I have had some authors from the UK or from New Zealand like, hey, can you edit for me? And I have to tell them, 
I could, but I might screw up your punctuation because I'm American. And even though I lived in the UK, that was a long time ago. So I would like it if there was a certification where you can say, okay, I'm looking for certified editors who are experts in British English or who are experts in science fiction. Like I would, I would love to see that where you could just kind of narrow down someone where there's a, a, a mark of approval where you know what you're getting versus, you know, going through social media and going through Fiverr and like, please let this person be who they say they are, <laughs> you know, because right now sometimes it's a crapshoot. Absolutely. Okay, so Nikki's asked, I have an LLC to cover my pen name and any author services I might offer. Is that okay? Or do I need an entirely new business? Oh, no, you don't need a new business. So my LLC is Shockley Press LLC. And that's what I publish my fiction under. That's what um, I do my editing under. Now I do always when I make my contracts, I say the nonsense free editor is a uh, DBA alias of Shockley Press LLC. So, you know, you're you're saying this is the name of my business. We are headquartered in Kansas City. You know, you're you're letting people know what your actual business name is. So it, it's perfectly fine to just use the same LLC for both. Just make sure, you know, your accountant is aware uh, for, for tax purposes. That's fantastic. Um, so, um, what Raya P's asks, what editing tools beside Word and Fictionary do you use? Uh, until recently, I used the free version of Grammarly. Um, I really, I only used that for the correctness feature because I wanted to point out things that most humans miss. Like if there's a missing article like A or the, I'm going to gloss over that every time. So I really needed that tool. Um, I don't know if there was an update or whatever, but they changed their Word plugin to where you don't get that nice little list on the side anymore. Now you get that stupid window at the bottom and I didn't like that. So I moved over to Pro Writing Aid and I'm, why didn't I do it earlier? It's it's wonderful. Um, it's great. And again, I mostly use the correctness feature. It's such a powerful tool, but I mostly just use it for, you know, what what would I miss in my normal editing? And it's it's very good with that. Um, so Sherry's um, Leclerc said, for anyone in Canada, Enidas, Canada's has certification programs. Um, right, Nikki's asked, can you talk a little bit about ghostwriting? I have a hazy idea, but that's it. Thank you. Yes. And the way that I fell into it was I had several authors who had written most of their book, but, you know, maybe it was a sci-fi book and it was only... 40,000 words. And they're like, look, I really need to bulk this out. Would you do a combination of editing, ghostwriting? And that's how I got into it. So I would edit it first and then I would write my notes. Here's what it needs. You know, here's what it could have if we wanted to add another 30,000 words. And then, you know, it was scary at first, I'll be honest. It's like, how do I write somebody else's vision and somebody else's characters? But what I found was in some ways it was easier because it was more clinical. It's like, I see what the story is doing. I see what the structure is doing. All right, here's what you need to add here. And it, it was less emotionally fraught than writing because I'm like, oh, well, what if it's what if it's bad? And what does this say about me? So I, I would encourage people that, you know, ghostwriting can seem very intimidating, but I, I actually like it quite a bit. Um, and then of course, um, I do a lot of ghostwriting from scratch. Um, the majority of my ghostwriting work is memoirs, um, informational self-help. So these are business owners who who want to have a book as part of their, you know, merch. Um, I did one for a dog trainer. I did one for a copywriter. And, you know, he's he writes for a living. That's what he does. But copywriting is kind of its own skill. Uh, so he wanted someone who had experience with book writing. Um, and then I'm also lucky enough to have several fiction authors um, who, who come to me and ask me to write their novels. Typically, these are authors who already have a platform um, and they kind of need help keeping they, keeping up with the volume, basically. There are a few first-time fiction novelists who have me ghostwrite for them. Just full disclosure, they are usually independently wealthy. This is their rich person hobby and, you know, they just kind of want to say that they're an author. But, um, you know, it, it's something that I fell into and, and, of course, it's a higher rate per word. Uh, so that's it's it's nice way to to get your income there. That gets us over to Liz's question, and uh, Liz Mason, is the charge the same for ghostwriting per word? Definitely not. <laughs> it is much much higher. Um, so and, and there's a very very big um, disparity in what ghostwriters charge. 
um, whether you use AI or whether you're allowed to use AI or whether you're not. So for my bespoke ghostwriting, which is no AI at all, um, I charge 13 cents a word for fiction. I charge 15 cents a word for nonfiction. And I recently raised my rates uh, to 17 words, uh, 17 cents a word for memoirs, because those require so much more work. You have to sit on multiple um, interviews with your memoirist. And, and a lot of it is actually very emotionally fraught. Uh, people with happy childhoods don't want to write about their memoirs for some reason. So it's like, okay, this is a lot more effort. I, I need to raise my rates. Um, and it's okay to have a range as well. So, you know, I, I post the range for ghostwriting because some clients, regardless of their genre, need more work than others. So I give myself that flexibility because writing from scratch is more difficult than editing what's already there. Okay, fantastic. So the charge can't be given at the start, Liz is asking. Oh, it's always given at the start. Now I do ghostwriting in um, milestones. So what I do for ghostwriting is um, we get we have to have a call. The call is not optional for ghostwriting. Um, whatever material the client has. So if they've already created an outline, they send that to me. If they have notes and character sketches, they send that to me. If they don't already have those things and I need to make those for them, then obviously they're going to get a higher rate because I'm I'm basically doing idea generation. But if they already have everything, you know, they've got a scene by scene, you know, play out, or sometimes they want a screenplay converted into a novel, you know, that's a lot less work on my part. So they don't they don't need to pay as high of a rate as if I'm just like starting from a two cent or a two or three sentence blurb. So it depends what they bring to the table. Um, and I see in the comments, you know, uh, they the the stated rate of EFA is 20 to 27 cents per word. Yes. So that is much higher. Um, and again, like with editing, you want to gauge what your your target clientele will pay. Um, so for me, I, it's comfortable having a lot of people coming in at around the 15 cent per word. Um, if you start getting higher, you start narrowing down the number of clients that you can get. Um, a, lot, a lot of times copywriters experience that too, where they write copy, but they they charge a lot for it. And the reason they charge a lot for it is because they know that they can sell, but only if the company is already established, if that makes sense. It's like they only work with people who already have a lot of money. Fantastic. And you said at the beginning that you are hiring this week because you're getting your fourth, was it, um, mm -hmm. editor that you're bringing in? That's absolutely fabulous news. So you obviously understand the market and understand how to gauge it properly to be able to get on more and more clients. Congratulations with that. And um, I haven't popped a link in for your book. Would you like to pop that in? To the yes. Let's see. Let's see. Figure out how to do this. Okay, Google hates me. <laughs> Here we go. Righty. Put that right there in the chat. And it is available on ebook, paperback, and audiobook. So, however, you like to absorb your books, it is available. And again, the book talks about you know, getting set up the gear that you'll need um, talks about nightmare clients and what payment processors to go with, uh, how to get clients. And then also it talks about the kind of the nitty gritty of getting started as a copywriter an editor or a ghostwriter um, and kind of how to flex your bona fides and how to use your day job as, uh, you know, resume worthy stuff. Because, you know, not everybody has, you know, writing centric things that they can flex to get clients. So whatever your resume is, you know, you should be able to do that. You want to show your client. It's like, okay, well, you know, I'm I'm not a professional editor yet. I'm just getting started. But here's why you should trust me with your manuscript. Um, so everybody starts somewhere, and I I like to make sure that you don't you don't need 15 years of experience to get started. <laughs> obviously. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for an absolutely fabulous um talk today. Um, I think that everybody who's here who's considering their um, editing business should get your book um, because it sounds like it's exactly what we all need. So thank you so much for coming along and thank you everyone in the community for your absolute wonderful kindness and we'll see you all very, very soon.